This document is from Satan. This document is from the devil. This document by Tucho Fernandez, no matter how many good things are in it, it'll turn you into an atheist. It'll turn you into a practical atheist. It will turn you into a worshiper of Satan. Satan worship is about worshiping yourself. You worship yourself. You're God, right? This is what Lucifer says. St. Michael says, who, is, who can say this? Who is like God? Mikael, right? Who is like God? Who are you to say you're, you're like God? This document is the cry of Satan. It's a disaster. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's another day of the week that ends in Y. So, of course, we're going to have something crazy coming out of Rome when it comes to the doctrine of the faith, specifically in this case with the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith and Tucho Fernandez and this new document called Dignitas Infinitas. I'm going to just pull that up here uh, for you. Just give me half a second here. So here's the document from the Doctrine of the Faith, and it's about infinite dignity. Now, there are many problems with the assertion that human beings have infinite dignity. I actually do believe this document is heretical. Uh, I mean that. Um, maybe there could be a distinction made between grave error and heresy, which are technically distinctions. Both of them are mortally sinful and, and awful, uh, and neither of them is going to save your soul or is, or is going to really uh, make it harder for you to save your soul, at least and put it that way. Uh, one who is in grave error isn't saved just because it's not technically a heresy. I do believe these are heretical. There are heretical statements in here about the nature of God, and at least in the loose sense, whether it's officially a, uh, a grave error or heresy, we can leave that up to the theologians to debate how many heresies and errors can dance on the head of a pin. In any event, this document makes the astonishing claim that human beings essentially have infinite dignity. And we're going to go over some commentary from some very astute minds on the subject, as well as look at some stuff here from this book called Prometheus, The Religion of Man. This is by Angelus Press, written by Father Calderon, um, Alvaro Calderon, I believe he was seminary rector in Argentina. I know he was in Argentina. I think he was seminary rector. He's one of the great minds in the Society of St. Pius X. Him and Father Glaze are, are kind of heavy hitters when it comes to theological uh, conversations. And it's a wonderful book. I've talked about it. I've read it. You can see, maybe if I show you, you can see that, you know, I've got footnotes and bookmarks and, you know, highlights basically everywhere because it was one of those books where you were finished and it was like you covered the whole thing in, in yellow and green ink because everything was, was worth uh, remembering. And it's about the humanist spirit, which is this, which is really what's underpinning the problem with this. And we're going to look at why that is. Um, and uh, we're going to get to that in just a second. But first, I am going to Italy this fall with Father Albert Calio, a traditional Dominican. And I guarantee you there will be no humanism or modernism or dignitas infinita, whatever this is. Uh, there'll just be old-timey Catholicism in the heart of the old Roman Empire. All the trouble in Rome, it is easy to forget about one unshakable fact. Our church is the Roman Catholic Church, and Rome is the Eternal City. What a perfect time to go on a pilgrimage to the Eternal City and the other monumental sites of Catholic heritage in beautiful Italy. Join Father Albert Calio and me this November as we tour through the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast as we attend daily Mass in the Old Rite in the footsteps of St. Peter and St. Francis. Click the link in the description to register for this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to discover the heart of the Catholic faith in the heart of the old Roman Empire. Click the link in the description area for this podcast or go to kennedyhall.ca. That's Kennedy, sorry, yeah, kennedyhall.ca slash Italy, kennedyhall.ca slash Italy, or just click the link in the description area, whether you're watching or listening on one of the podcast platforms. Also, pretty, pretty soon, I'm going to be uh, transitioning my podcasting host to my Substack. Um, so if you listen on iTunes or Spotify, uh, it's not really going to change much, uh, I don't think. It'll still be available, all the episodes that I've done. It's just going to be hosted by Substack. So when I do that, I will make sure that I make an announcement on those platforms for that change coming. I think nothing changes at your end, except maybe you have to press like a couple buttons on your app. Or, I don't know, but I don't think it's a big deal. But just uh, stay tuned for that. I'm going to sort of integrate those for a number of reasons. Okay, so let's real quickly look at the commentary from Dr. Kwasniewski because he gives us an astute observation right off the jump. So here is Dr. K on Twitter. I guess this was 
originally on his Facebook, I think. And here we go. So we're going to read a couple um, citations. For, we're going to read some of his thoughts here. And he says, uh, today is D-Day. That's right, Dignity Day. I will be studying the new document, but it's rather depressing to see that it opens with a stupendous falsehood. And this is from the beginning of the document, which we'll look at uh, quickly in, in a second. Every human person possesses an infinite dignity inalienably, inalien, in, inalienably grounded in his or her very being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state, or situation the person may ever encounter. So before we even get to his commentary here, if you're listening at home for the, you know, for the kids in the back of the classroom, I think you can probably understand that this is a problem because the idea is, is that the scope of the dignity of the human person is without limits. It's limitless just because they exist. There are some implications that come from that that we can reason to before we even get into the astute commentary from Dr. K and another source and this book that we're going to do in a, in a minute here. But why would we get baptized if we already have in, infinite dignity? I mean, if we are dignified, we might, one might even say uh, in a state of justice, which would, I mean, could a person who's infinitely dignified, who has infinite dignity, not already be in a state of justice? Could someone who doesn't, who could someone who does have infinite dignity be in a place of original sin? Is that possible? I mean, you can already see where some issues are going to arise. Those are some general thoughts, and, and Dr. K will ex expand on these, but already off the bat, you think to yourself, I don't really know if that's the case. Um, if every man has infinite dignity, then why is the Virgin Mary more special than you or I? There's lots of consequences to this way of thinking. Because it's not Catholic, so we shouldn't expect these heretics to give us Catholic thinking, but let's continue. And he goes, no creature has an infinite dignity. That's sheer balderdash. Only God has, or rather is, infinite dignity. And those who participate in Christ share finitely in his dignity as son of God. Those who rebel against God lose the dignity. He intended to give them, and while retaining a finite metaphysical dignity as rational animals, lack the dignity for which they were created. You might say at most that Christian man uh, possesses a quasi-infinite dignity through participation, something that goes beyond anything and everything else in the order of material creation, meaning participation in the divine life through the sacraments. Put differently, that which is infinite is literally that which has no limits or definition or end, outside itself. That's why God is rightly called infinite, but man's dignity is very much tied to his nature and his end. If his dignity were truly infinite, then he would stand in no need of God or of redemption slash salvation, what I was trying to get at. So if that's a document's first line, one's confidence deflates. Evidently in recognition of how controversial it will prove to be, Tucho Fernandez lectured the press today on religious submission of intellect and will. I guess that's what he did yesterday in the press. Even when no one asked, had raised any objection, he knows what's coming and wants to preempt, with, preempt it with authoritarianism. Dr. K has more to say here. I'll just press this next here. This is a little bit smaller. I think if I, there you go, if I do this, we can read it together. Um, okay. He continues, At today's Mass of the Annunciation, the second Alleluia verse proclaims, The rod of Jesse hath blossomed, a virgin hath brought forth God and man, God hath given peace, reconciling the lowest with the highest in himself. Alleluia. Actually, I just want to, for one second here, this, this idea that everyone has infinite dignity, not only is it equating every man with Christ, and we're going to go through why the spirit of the Second Vatican Council's humanism renders God not God. And we're going to explain what that means with some citations from this book. But it's also a debasing or a downgrading of the Virgin Mary, if we really think about it. So the fact that this was um, released right around, just after Easter and right around the time of the moved feast of the Annunciation. I don't know. I just, I see some monkey business there, if I could say it that way. But anyway, let's continue. Um, the only human person to whom one could uh, one could, with any plausibility whatsoever attribute an infinite dignity would be our most holy lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, on account of the grace and privilege of the divine maternity, with which her immaculate conception at the beginning of her life 
uh, and her assumption as its end are intimately bound up. She is the human person without blemish, without sin, without disorder, who is the new creation in Christ, participating in his redemption in the highest conceivable manner, so that after God himself, she holds the highest rank among creatures, which is why we call her Queen of Heaven, Regina Cele Letare. And even here, the term infinite seems out of place, for it is impossible to say of any creature that it is infinitely or has an infinite X, whatever X may signify. Examples. This creature is infinitely wise. Not possible. This creature has infinite life. Not possible, because it does have a beginning. This creature is infinitely happy. Not possible on its own, of course. Uh, with God, obviously, we participate in this divine life, but that's not on its own. It's not possible at all. This creature has infinite glory. Not possible. Um, all of these are and must be false statements. So, too, is the statement that this creature has infinite dignity. Very good, Dr. K. I recall reading once, I think it was in Gary Goulagrange, that Our Lady has a quasi-infinite dignity owing to her divine maternity. If that is what it takes to reach the quasi-level, the rest of us aren't even close. Some people object, why are you so persnickety? Why do you focus on this one phrase instead of appreciating the document as a whole? The reason is simple. This erroneous phrase, dignitas infinita, gives the new document its name and entire orientation. Words matter because the word, the logos, matters. We should hardly need to be reminded of this, but providentially, the very feast of the word made flesh puts us in mind of it. Let us not forget that every great error in theology hinges on one or two words. For example, homoousion versus homoeus, however you pronounce that Greek word, homoousion, or akon versus eidos, faith versus faith alone. This is talking about the nature of Christ and the Christology with homoousios and homoousion, etc. This is Arianism and so forth. The great Aristotelian philosopher Hippocrates, apostle, once said concerning modern philosophers, I think he's being funny here. Uh, I read their works until I reach a, I read their works until I reach a major error, and then I put them aside. That means I haven't had to waste a lot of time on Kant or Hegel. One is justified in doing the same with a document in the first sentence, giving the premise of the whole is false. Now, this Dr. K. Let's round of applause. Round of applause for Dr. K. Congratulations, Dr. K. You knocked it out of the park. Now, all these things he said are true, and I think the last thing is something we're going to need to really focus on for a second here, and this is the idea that when you find a major error that is the undergirding philosophy of the document, you throw it out. This is why I cannot stand, I cannot stand the Nouvelle Theology bros who want to, who insist that traditional Catholics swallow as much Henri de Lubac and whatever, whatever the other thinkers are, um, uh, Balthazar, etc. They want us to swallow all that stuff as much as possible because, like, you just don't understand it. You just don't understand it. No, I understand. There are fundamental errors at the beginning of the thing. So I'm not going to read the rest. I mean, this is so simple for people. You know, if someone said, um, I'm going to teach your kids history, and you open up the history book that they're using, and it's, uh, you know, in the beginning... God sent aliens to the world to populate the land of Egypt, and from there all civilizations sprung. You would say, well, you're not teaching my kids history. And they say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, listen, listen, listen. The rest of it is clearly true. Come on, man. It just talks about everything else that's in your history books. I'm still not going to let that book be taught to my children because it begins with an insane falsehood. There may be some strange things about ancient civilizations that we could discuss on another avenue, but I'm just using this as an example. So um, it's just like another example, you know, listen, just because the, the meal has a little bit of poison in it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat it. It's like 99.9% .9 good. That's just 0.1% strychnine. It's like, okay. Now, from a perspective of being a grown up, you, you know, we can study this because, you know, we'd like to understand these errors and things like that, uh, to understand how they think. Um, but I can tell you, having had to read a lot of Contra Hegel for this modernism book that I'm still working on for Sophia, which is coming out later this year, by the way. Uh, man, oh man, they've got errors in their beginning and, and the rest of it can't make sense. You know, this is why, you know, not to heart, not to, 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 uh, criticize my American confreres too much, but the Constitution of the United States, there's fundamental errors about, you know, religious freedom and so forth. 
Um, so there can never be the kingship of Christ in the United States. The way, with, like Christ cannot exist where there is religious liberty, so called, because it's giving the devil and Christ the same rights. So they're both kings, which means neither of them are kings. When Christ obviously is king, but you know what I'm saying in a practical sense. So when there's an error at the beginning of something, the rest of the thing is, it, even if it contains many great statements, and there will be many statements in it that are fine, because. This document is massive. And I wanted to show you how big this document is because it's actually kind of striking. Now, I'm going to show you two documents side by side. So this is the document by Tucho Fernandez. And we should also add, I'm going to go down to the bottom here. Um, right here. There it is. The Supreme Pontiff, uh, Pope Francis. I'm going to make this bigger. The Supreme Pontiff Pope Francis at the audience granted to the undersigned prefect of the Dicastery, so to Tucho, with the secretary, blah, 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 and uh, approved this document. So so not only is this kind of hit the news on uh, the day of the moved Feast of the Annunciation, but it also was approved on the traditional date of the Annunciation, which couldn't happen because of Holy Week, but still, still the date of commemoration, nine months from the birth of Christ. Anyway, so... This is approved by Pope Francis. So you can't just say, this isn't the Pope. No, listen, okay? I can't stand that argument from these crazy people who defend everything Pope Francis says. Um, you know, if you're the boss and you approve the budget, it's your fault. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you're not the accountant. You're in charge, so suck it up. That's just the way life works. Uh, and you knew about it, so you are complicit in the error. Now, uh, okay, so let's look at this document. How many paragraphs is this? Let's count. They're numbered, which is nice. 66 paragraphs. May as well be 666. But anyway, 66 paragraphs. Let's look at this. This one is called Pescendi. This is the landmark encyclical by Pius X, a great, amazing super saint of the church. It's about modernism. Kind of ironic that this document itself, in English, doesn't have paragraph numbers in Latin, I realize, which made it difficult for me to find the same things in Latin and English, but I've learned that. 58. So, this document by Tucho Fernandez, riddled with heresy, longer and more verbose, more hot air being, being, being exhaled from reading the document of heresy versus the one by Pius X. What's astonishing is in this document Pius X wrote, Pascendi, it's one of the longest encyclicals ever, um, to that point in the papacy at least, he, it might have been the longest up at that point, he completely destroyed the modernists and he explained everything that they would do. Everything. And then Tucho Fernandez comes on, comes along some years later and Pope Francis approves his document. And uh, it's basically the incarnation of all the errors that Pope Pius X warned against. I think there's some heavenly symmetry there in a sense. Okay, so I'm going to look at one more resource as to show you why the document has major issues. And then we're going to get to this book, as I said, and read some stuff from there. I'm probably going to go for about 40 minutes today. We've been talking for about 17. Okay, so let's look at just another article here real quick. So this is by um, Louis Varecchio. Now, I understand Louis Varecchio. I believe he is some shade of state of a contest. Uh, so if you are someone who that triggers you, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, I've... I've made my position known on state of occultism. I don't believe the position, but I also don't believe that those who conscientiously hold the position are not Catholic, given the insanity of the church and the confusing nature of what to do when the Pope is a heretic. So I don't throw stones in that capacity. And Louis is a first-class critic of, of these things, and he's written many good things in the past. Um, and this is a great thing he's just produced on this. So bravo to him, and I commend him for it, and, and I'm really happy to share some of his work. Okay, so... It's called Dignitas Infinita, or Unbridled Humanism, on Unbridled Humanism. So he the, the thing that he does here, which is why I use Dr. K's first and then his second, is because Louis brings the receipts. Let's put it that way. So he goes here, okay? The same sentence that Dr. K says is nonsense, which it is. So the, the sentence is, every human person possesses an infinite dignity, I already read this, all right? Inal inalienably grounded in his or her very being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state, situation, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so then he goes to scripture, Louis does. St. Paul wrote to the Romans, We are buried together with him by baptism into death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. 
For you have not received the spirit of bondage again in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Catechism of the 1917 Encyclopedia explains, Baptism is therefore the sacrament by which we are born again of water and the Holy Ghost, that is, by which we receive in a new in a new and spiritual life the dignity of adoptions as sons of God and heirs of God's kingdom. Right away, there's a different sort of dignity attached to baptism. So are we are we are we super infinite when we're baptized? This doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if you have infinite dignity because you exist, then baptism can do nothing for you. And then baptism is just a symbol, which is what the modernists believe. And these men are modernists. They believe religious truths are only conveyed by symbols. I'm actually writing the chapter presently on symbolism in modernism. Um, as we, like, literally, I'm taking a break from writing, I'm recording this, and I'm reading Pashendi and writing on how the modernists view symbolism. And it makes perfect sense that they would, by the logic of their, now they would have some fancy cutesy way of getting out of being labeled an official heretic because they're serpentine and the devil is very clever. Nonetheless, the consequences of their beliefs are that sacraments must be symbolic because if you already have infinite dignity, you can't get any better. So baptism is a sign of being washed which is symbolic of whatever, but nothing happens because you already have infinite dignity. So let's go back to Louis' uh, work here. Pius XII, so this is great. This is a really good, I mean, he does scripture, he does, it says theology, and he does the Pope, right? Like he does all these things. So, uh, let the faithful therefore consider to what a dignity they are raised by the sacrament of baptism. That's in Mediatra Day. So listen, right here, we're going we're gonna to go a little bit more. Right here, this document by Tucho, approved by Pope Francis, is dead in the water. You don't have to have 57 citations. You can. We, Louis has more, and there's many more that we could do. You don't have to do that. It's done. It's done. When I was a teacher, and kids would hand me in an essay, if they started the essay with, you know, I remember one essay, it was like something like, you know, um, hundreds of years have passed since the beginning of time or something like that, you know. To try to be some sort of articulate writer of like hundreds of years. I mean, this essay's done. That wasn't even technically an error. There have been hundreds, there have been dozens, there have been tens, there's been many, 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 many hundreds, you know. But it wasn't even technically wrong. But I said to this kid, you know, this grade nine or something, this poor kid just learning how to do this stuff. And I said, You've got to start again because I can't take this seriously because it's been, you know, thousands and whatever. Um, but you just hundreds of years have passed since the beginning of time. It's like your essay is done, you know. And this is a grade nine kid. This is, these these men are 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 apparently educated, you know, hierarchs in the church, including the Pope, and they're still approving this nonsense. So this document is dead from the beginning. It's dead. It's gone. It's it's got an error right at the beginning. Every and it's the and it's the title of the document and it's the foundational principle. It's the it's the speaking of the solar eclipse, those stupid little stupid little glasses everyone bought that they throw out later because we're so concerned with environmentalism. So let's buy plastic cardboard things to watch a sun for five seconds and throw out because we want to save the baby seals. It's amazing how stupid liberalism makes your brain. Um, in any event, uh, speaking of e eclipse and so forth, you know what was my analogy there? I actually just lost my analogy. No, well, anyway, um, point being. These men are intelligent. They are, it's amazing when you lose your train of thought. That happens to me sometimes. Sometimes I'm able to pause the show, but in this case, I couldn't. So now I look like a fool. I guess God's humbling me. In any event, this document is done from David. Oh, I know what it was. See, thank you for staying with me. The lens, looking through the glasses, you see it all comes together. And circle gets the square. So yes, speaking of looking through lenses, looking at the eclipse yesterday and so forth, this is this this document, as Doctor Phaser said, really is an eclipse of God uh, in the sense that it, man eclipses God because man becomes God. So man, you know, and we'll talk about that in this book, uh, Prometheus. Um, reminds one of the prophecy of La Salette with the uh, eclipse of the whatever the eclipse of the church or whatever. But in any event, 
Um, the lens through which this document needs to be looked at is through the lens of this notion that man has infinite dignity. If that's the case, then the rest of it is interpreted by that key, and that's the point. So if that's false, then the interpretive key is false. Therefore, no proper interpretation of the document is possible because the very lens is in error. You can't, see, if someone says, look over there at that sunset, use these binoculars, but the binoculars are a smudge, are smudged or cracked, you can't see it clearly. It won't ever happen. You can't just say, look harder. No, the lens is broken. You can't look at this document as an Orthodox Catholic document because it begins with a heresy. And that's the title of it. It's the interpretive key. And that also... It does have something to do with Vatican II, which we're going to go to again quickly in this document. We're going to finish here with um, Louis Verecchio's work. So this is the idea. If, if, if Tucho Fernandez is correct, then Pius XII is wrong. Because Pius XII said they consider a high dignity they're raised to by the sacrament of baptism. Now, little basic theology here. An encyclical written in the solemn weight of the magisterial office, the way Pius XII wrote that document, whether it's infallible or not, that's a point. It contains many infallible things. It is clearly of a higher weight than that of, of Tucho Fernandez. The dicastery isn't even a congregation. It's And a congregation, is that even a holy office? I don't even know. But the point being, it clearly, um, it's clearly eclipsed, to continue the analogy, by Pius XII. And Pius XII says something completely different. It can't be the case that they're both correct at the same time because two things that are in contradiction to one another cannot be true in the same way and the same place and at the same time. This is a law of non-contradiction. Two plus two cannot be five and four at the same at the same time. It's not possible. I can't be here and somewhere else at the same time unless I'm bilocating, which I'm probably not going to do anytime soon. So um, in any event, you know what's funny? I just thought of it. There will be some Pope Splainer types. Vatican splainer types, they might even go so far as being like it's possible for both to be true because of bilocation. I think that's probably a new argument the Pope splainers are going to use is that it's possible for Pius XII to be correct in the 1940s and 50s, and it's possible for Pope Francis and Tucho Fernandez to be correct in 2024, even though their statements are completely contrary to one another because the truth can bilocate. I bet you they'll say something like that because they're that insane. Um, in any event, but here's the thing. The modernists believe one of the pillars of modernism is that evolution or that doctrine changes, it evolves. The evolution of dogma. So so they 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 would have no problem saying Pius XII said that, and that was believed for a certain reason, but we learn more now about whatever, 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 because we have to reconcile the faith with modern science, blah, 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 which means the faith changes, which means the faith isn't even the faith, because it's simply a matter of opinion, which is the destruction of all religion. This document is representative of the modernist spirit, which is not only the destruction of Catholicism, but it's the destruction of religion in general. This document is representative of the, it is a destroyer of reason, it is a destroyer of religion per se, and anyone who defends it is out of their mind, just simply put. Okay, so I think we've done enough there. I want to go to this book now, and Louis Verecchio wrote a lot more, but that that alone was was enough. That alone was enough. So, um, and look at his stuff. He's got a great document on it. I don't want to read the whole thing here because I want you to go to his website and read it and support the man for doing the great work that he did. Um, nonetheless, I want to um, bring up uh, this book here, Prometheus, and just give me half a second to find the right page. All right, so it's too much for me to go into here unless I make this a three-hour podcast, which I don't have time to do. I'm sorry, I got to get back to some other work. Um, Vatican II is incarnated in this notion that man has infinite dignity. That is the spirit of Vatican II. In fact, this is called Prometheus, the religion of man. Can you interpret Vatican II correctly? This is the interpretive key. Conservatives don't like it when I say this. They think that I'm just being too short-sighted. I got to read the Nouvelle Theology, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't have to read endless amounts of Nouvelle Theology because I don't, just like I don't have to read endless amounts of Tucho Fernandez because if there's errors in the presuppositions, I'm not going to spend all my waking time doing that. I think I'd rather prefer to read things that are actually uh, distinctly Catholic. In any event, and that is, by the way, the idea that you must read all of these various things that you find errors in in order to understand things better, that actually is liberalism. 
Um, no one believes that in anything else in their life. No one says, in order to truly understand art, you need to go to one of those modern art exhibits where people like pee on the wall and stare at the like head of a goat and that's like their art installation. No one says you need to do that in order to appreciate Michelangelo better. No one believes that. That's so stupid. In the same way with intellect, you don't have to read things that contain errors in them in order to understand things that are true better. In fact, the opposite is true. If you get to the point where you can, and I shouldn't say it's always the opposite, you can read, like if you're trying to debunk something like Protestantism and you're from a perspective of, of understanding the truth, okay, you can understand what they believe. But Protestantism does not help you understand Catholicism better in, in any way other than a negative sense, where uh, perhaps if you're reading something that's heretical, you might um, come to understand the truth in a way in relation to that error, but you don't have to understand the error in order to understand the truth. This is like saying, make sure your kids go learn math in a way that's not correct so they can do math better. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. No one would ever say, oh, this kid, he gets perfect all the time. He really doesn't understand math. I mean, this kid needs to make errors before he's going to understand. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it's not like sports where, you know, you fall and you learn or whatever, because this we're talking about metaphysical truths here. These are things that have a perfection to them. Um, anyway, so the idea that you have to smash a bunch of ideas together and get the synthesis out of them, this is Hegelian modernism. This is modern philosophy. This is modernism. This is liberalism. This is heresy. This is heresy. And many Catholics fall for this. Hence why I'm writing the book. So people will tell you, you got to read all this liberal stuff. And No, you don't. No, you don't. Socrates understood this. Dr. K talks about that in his book on sacred music. So I just had to pause there a sec. It was a package being delivered. Um, so, yes, Dr. K talks about this in his book. Socrates, he relays one of these accounts of Socrates' life, and he's talking to a sophist or something of the sort, which is like a, uh, his, his argument was basically nihilist. Uh, reading Socrates is fascinating because his dialogues with the sophists are kind of like Christ's dialogues with the Pharisees. It's almost like a prefigurement in the pagan world. It's very fascinating. But in any event, he says before this nihilist, if you don't know what nihilism is, it's it's pes it's it's fatalism. It's pessimism. It's this idea that there's a nothingness. The the point of existence is nothingness. It's very depressing, right? So. Um, and it's it's basically the same thing as evolutionary theory, materialism. The only end is that we become uh, part, you know, we, we basically are annihilated and we don't exist anymore because there's no point to existence. It's very, very, very depressing. No wonder everyone has suffered some depression in our day because they imbibe this philosophy. So um, Socrates says to the, to the nihilist, essentially, before he even begins, he says, stop. Don't tell me your argument. I don't want you to pour that into my soul. I don't want you to pour that into my soul. Because this is the way the mind works. The mind is in the soul, right? Because it's a metaphysical property. It's not a physical property. We, we, see the, we see what's in the mind through the physical properties of the brain, but the brain is not the mind, okay? Um, anyway, so it's sort of like you see things on your TV, but your TV doesn't contain the things, right? So as long as the TV works, it can access the signals that are uh, in sort of unlimited space. This is why the mind can be filled with unlimited amounts of information and never run out of space, okay? It's not like a hard drive, uh, if that makes sense. I'm getting in the weeds here, but read Augustine to understand it better because he has a wonderful treatise in it on chapter in chapter 10, I believe, of St. Augustine's Confession or Book 10. So Prometheus, Religion of Man. I'm going to read something here. So there's lots of, you know, preamble stuff, but I'm going to get to the meat, the meat of it here, so bear with me. This is in a section about the inevitable turn to anthropocentrism, meaning making man the center of existence. We should be theocentric, not anthropocentric, and he's talking about the conclusions of the conciliar spirit of, of Second Vatican Council. And he says this, and I'll give an explanation. The supposed transcendence that might make the difference between Catholic and atheistic humanism does no more than aggravate the error. So what he's saying here is that the humanist mentality that's infiltrated the church, it tries to combat atheism by saying, no, 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 man is divine. Basically, that's what it is. Man is limitless. 
in his dignity, which makes him God, right? Because only God is limitless in his dignity, infinite dignity. Um, and so he says, this actually, this actually does more, does no more than aggravate the error. You see, the atheistic materialist world believes that there is no God and that man is all there is. And that's a problem. So this, the humanist Catholic will say, no, 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 you don't understand. Catholicism basically makes man into God. That still leads to atheism practically because you don't need God if man is God. It's actually a form of, 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 of humanistic self-worship, uh, the cult of man. It's, it's, it's a problem. He continues. He says, because in identifying the glory of man with the glory of God... So in identifying the glory of man with the glory of God and setting it up as the end simpliciter of creation, the create the creator is subordinated to the creature. So this is how it works. If, if the dignity of creation, if man is limitless in his dignity, then all creation is subservient to to man because this is how order works if you imagine a, a, a pyramid or a diagram here okay you have this hierarchy of the created order from the simplest organisms to the more complicated to the more complicated to the most complicated which is man and then man has this ability to reason to use his rational thought and his 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 through his senses he can understand metaphysical principles and therefore he elevates his his, his intellect and his perception to the divine reality, which does not change because it subsists in itself, because it's existing in and of itself. And this is why creation is like a pyramid where we have the lowest, simplest things going up to their source, which is the divine reality, which is the three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay? This is something that even pagans understand historically. Hence why they do things like build pyramids, because the pyramids actually represent the ordered nature of reality. They're not just a conspiracy for, uh, you know, ancient aliens. So the problem here is that man becomes the end of creation. So creation exists for man, which is so ironic because this is a liberal idea, right? Man, man is outside of all confines because he is limitless. Right? He can make his own morality and so forth. This is the same error that, that the devil presents to Adam and Eve. You know, you will become like gods knowing good and evil. This document from, from Tucho Fernandez approved by Pope Francis is a satanic document because it's saying you can become like gods because only gods are infinite in dignity. Anyway, infinite in anything. And this is one of the ironic things is that this world that we live in that is so obsessed with the dignity of man, which makes man into God, is also extremely um, environmentalist, which is completely contradictory because if man is the Lord of creation, then all things are for him and he should use them as he pleases. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, it continues. For he who sets himself to seek a good as an end in itself is seeing in that good his own perfection. This is so important. This Remember that. This is so important. From which it follows that if God should promote his extrinsic glory, so the glory outside of himself, as an end in itself, and not his own intrinsic glory, goodness, it would imply that for God his creation would be an added perfection that would make him better. Because always and necessarily the end simpliciter is the perfection of the agent and if they are two different entities, the agent is subordinated to the end as such. Hence, applying to God an end distinct from his own goodness is to imply and declare that God is not God. This line of thinking is the death of God. To suggest that man has infinite dignity is to suggest that man is God, which means God is not God, which is to destroy God himself. I'm going to break some of this down because it's a little bit complicated. But what he's talking about here, if God should promote his extrinsic glory as an end in itself. So God has his intrinsic and extrinsic. So God is glorified in his creation, but his creation is outside of himself. Whereas um, this is opposed to his own intrinsic goodness, meaning 
the essence of who God is, is the greatest possible thing. And all things that are in creation only point to this intrinsic goodness. But there's a reversal here. Man is a creature. Is a creature. He's not, a cre- he's not the creator. Therefore, if man has infinite dignity and is limitless and is, God him- is a God, then the idea is that if the goodness and excellence of God is found in the perfection of his creation, then that means that the purpose of God is to perfect his creation because all things that are, all ends that we seek are the ultimate purpose for why we live. So that's why as Catholics, we say the only thing that matters is that we die in a state of grace because the whole time on this earth as pilgrims is so that we end in heaven. That's why we exist. We don't live here to glorify ourselves. We live here to glorify God because we must be pointed towards that trajectory because that's why we've been created. In this in this conception that, that man has infinite dignity, the notion is that... Um, the notion is that um, uh, the perfection of God is found in the externals, which is in man, which makes man into God, which means God finds his own perfection in man, which again is so problematic because that means there can be change in God as if God could be improved, which means God is not God. Do you see this? And he backs this up with Thomas Aquinas. And he says, this is from first part, question five, answer one, I think. It's hard for me to read the the Aquinas citations. It's like this whole citation world in itself. He says, the essence of good consists in something being desirable. The philosopher says in first ethics four that, that, that good is that which all desire. It is evident that something desirable is so insofar as it is perfect because all desire their own perfection. So this is, this footnote was used um, for the part of this citation where he talks about, for he who sets himself to seek a good as an end in itself is seeking in that good his own perfection. So again, this is just hammering home the idea that if man has infinite dignity and man is the, cre- this is the creature, then, then man uh, perfects God by his infinite dignity because the glory of God is found in the glory of man and therefore God is desiring to be perfected by his creature, which is to make the creature into the creator, which is satanic. Do you see this? It is satanic. This document is the philosophy of Lucifer. It is, I will be God. I will not serve God. I will make his creation serve me, a creature. And Lucifer was the highest created angel. He was the highest of angels, which is a creature. They're not infinite. They're, they're not eternal. They're eternal. They exist in a, in a, they have beginning but no end. Man has beginning and an end. God has no beginning and no end. So we are in the temporal sphere, the corporeal sphere, I think you call it, whatever it is. Angels are in the eternal sphere, which is where there's a beginning but no end, and God is in the eternal sphere, realm, I should say realm instead of sphere, where there is no beginning and no end. Alpha and omega, as Christ says. So, in any event, in any event, this document is satanic. This document is the manifestation of the error of Satan, the Luciferian ideology that I will not serve God and God will serve me. And it is a manifestation of the Luciferian proposition given to Adam and Eve that um, you will not do what God says, but you will become gods and be able to lord over. And when it says the knowledge of good and evil, it doesn't mean you'll know right and wrong. We know they have a conscience. It means you will then be the arbiter of what you deem to be correct and incorrect, which is what? Moral relativism, which is the idea you have your truth, your truth, I have my truth, blah, 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 blah. You get it. This document is from Satan. This document is from the devil. This document will make you at this, not this document, that's the book. This document by Tucho Fernandez, no matter how many good things are in it, it'll turn you into an atheist. It'll turn you into a practical atheist. It will turn you into a worshiper of Satan because ultimately... Satan worship is not just about, uh, Satan worship is not just about like devil horns and weird festivals and things. In fact, that's kind of parlor tricks. There's some evil in that, but Satan worship is about worshiping yourself. That's what it is. So it's funny when people will say, well, the temple of Satan, man, they're not into like magic and stuff. They just, they just believe in themselves. You mean like Satan? Like that is what Satanism is. You worship yourself. You're God, right? This is what Lucifer says. St. Michael says, who, is, who can say this? Who is like God? Mikael. 
right? Who is like God? Who are you to say you're, you're like God? This document is the cry of Satan. It's a disaster. I've said enough. As always, this has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, oh, let me know what you think in the comments. Talk to you next time.